Oh, hi, everybody, and welcome to Circle of Fellows, Episode 5. I am Shell Holtz. I will be moderating the panel today, and we have a great panel, all IABC fellows, of course. We have, uh, and I don't know what order you're seeing the thumbnails at the bottom of the screen. I know it's different for everybody, but um, we have Barbara Puffer. Uh, hi, Barbara. Hi. Coming, coming to us from Florida. Um, I'm just going in the order I see the uh, thumbnails at the bottom of the screen. Brad Whitworth, uh, where are you today, Brad? Are you at uh, Cisco? Um, I'm actually in wine country in my home, Windsor, oh, California. Excellent. Okay. Um, up in uh, the Napa Sonoma area. Mark Schumann. In Hello. I'm uh, today uh, direct from White Plains, New York. Yeah, I bet it is white too, isn't it? It's a little bit. <laughs> And Jennifer Waugh from Vancouver. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Shell. It's balmy in Vancouver today. Glad everybody could make it. Um, and uh, we may end up with some live viewers at some point, but of course this is all being recorded for consumption later. And uh, the topic today is uh, what we jokingly called the shuns, uh, accreditation, uh, certification, and continuing education and uh, it's always a topic of uh, debate in communication circles where there is no requirement as there is in some other professions. In fact the word profession is usually defined uh, by the fact that there needs to be some educational requirement and, and some kind of uh, licensing or certification required. When you talk about professions you usually talk about lawyers and doctors and accountants and, and um, other people who have to have those uh, criteria met in order to practice uh, their their craft. Uh, we in the communications profession don't. Anybody can hang out a shingle and call themselves a communicator and that ends up being part of the problem I think and uh, I think that's one of the reasons that this is such a compelling topic for a lot of people. But uh, let's uh, just get started going around the horn here and uh, finding out what various uh, accreditations we all have. I personally got accredited by IEBC in 1984. Um, in fact, I had just started my uh, new job as, uh, at the time, manager of employee communications at Mattel when I got the, uh, the letter in the mail telling me that I had passed the exam and I, I think they heard me uh, down in LA at my former employer that I'd been working for when I actually took the exam. Uh, when I shouted over that, it was it was very exciting. Uh, we'll, we can talk more about that later, but uh, Barbara, how about you? I first took the accreditation exam in 1976. I obviously was a much younger communicator then. I was in my second job. I worked for a bank, and I was sort of the jack of all trades and everything communication, the assistant to everybody from the advertising manager to the guy who did the annual report. In, in IBC, the chat mentors thought I should take this test with a minimum amount of experience. I didn't think I should. Back then, they, there were a lot of tutorial uh, materials, so I did study them, but I only passed half of the exam. I passed the oral exam with fellow head Fred Halpern. Um, oh. So that was a little devastating for a young communicator who didn't think she should take it in the first place. But in 79, I went through with flying colors. And that was the difference of one job, understanding the full breadth of a program and managing the budget and so forth. So I used to tell that story that you can um, uh, fail part of the exam and still live to tell a story. <laughs> That's right, and in fact, uh, I think there are a lot of people who uh, agree with me, and it was my uh, really big takeaway from taking the exam. Uh, while it was great to pass, it was seeing where I didn't do well, uh, where I could concentrate some uh, educational efforts that I found particularly beneficial. Um, but Brad, um, you are in that first cohort of IABC members who have gone through the certification process, but you are also accredited, right? Yeah, the accreditation took place in another era. Um, 1981, I was working at HP at the time, got to take the exam on an electric typewriter, um, tracked to the exam with Norm Leeper and Ray Leeper, both IABC fellows as well. We all drove up to the University of Nevada, Reno, and uh, took the exam. And I, I agree with you, Shell. It, it's as much about, it teaches you what it is that you don't know as much as it is a proof of what it is that you have sort of in that body of knowledge. 
and I think the same motivation was part of me wanting to work on the uh, certification side of things through uh, sort of the GCCC, the GCCC, to be able to uh, be one of the first six people to take and pass the uh, examination on the certification side. Great. Uh, and uh, Mark? Well, it was 1984, Shell the same year that you took him. I took it at the D7 district conference, which was in San Francisco, and I remember it well because I stayed up all night the night before because I got to the point of saying, why go to sleep? And it was in a very dark room filled with cigarette smoke because it was a smoker's collection taking the exam that year. And the typewriter was not electric. The typewriter was manual. And I, I most remember the beloved Ray Hamlin, who was uh, certainly a fixture in IABC and with accreditation, telling me, it will be just fine. You can take a nap when it's over. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I was, I was quite relieved when I passed, but also quite impressed with the people I took that day. I definitely, yeah, I, I took mine at the uh, World Conference, uh, the International Conference, uh, what they um, called it at the time, uh, in uh, Montreal, uh, is what I remember. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the fellow that drove me over there. He was an IABC stalwart at the time, and uh, his memory has just faded. But uh, anyway, uh, Jennifer. Hi, guys. Um... So, 1999, I did my accreditation exam, like Barbara and others, and some others. Um, failed the first go out, which was a huge, huge ego blow um, at the time. And I did it, I pursued it in large part because, um, you know, I wanted that sort of peer validation. I liked the IBC way of doing things, and I wanted to really embed that in my practice. And, um, and like many others, got told I couldn't really study for it, tried to anyway, and then failed um, on, a, on, on a computer, I will say, not an electric or manual typewriter, but one which, where the keyboard didn't keep up with the screen. So my exam was a mess. Poor uh, Peter Rofe, um, <laughs> who, who heard my sighs of exasperation that day. Um, I wrote it with a friend who was, uh, Eduardo Hodgins, who was, 9.1 months pregnant and who uh, <laughs> completed the exam without using the facilities <laughs> and, and then couldn't move at the end of it. But anyway, it was an experience, uh, a valuable experience, so valuable in fact that I came out of it um, pledging to get involved with IBC's accreditation program in ways that would help people uh, learn along the way and prepare for their exam. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I have been a pretty passionate evangelist for IBC and other associations certification and accreditation programs. Now IBC, uh, the folks who are accredited remain accredited, but there are no more accreditation exams. IABC has moved to certification, uh, and you know, I'm hearing the same questions about that, the same pushback that I've heard for years about accreditation, and that is, what is the value of this really? Uh, I, I had a boss once, um, you all know, but I won't name him here, uh, who absolutely rejected the idea of accreditation. He said, it, it does not validate my ability to do my job. I know what I know and I'm very good at it and I don't need those letters after my name to prove it, not to myself and, and not to my employers. So beyond what we've already discussed in terms of using the exam as a benchmark for the skills that you might be light on or might be missing, where else do you see the value of any of these kinds of processes that provide those letters after your name? Anybody who wants to jump in on that? Michelle, I have some thoughts on that, but first I'd like to um, disagree with your boss, who apparently I know, your old boss. But um, I actually was hired for the best job of my career because of accreditation. When they got down to the finalists, the fellow who was doing the hiring saw that as a, 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 a validation of my peers, and it gave me that little edge that got me my favorite job ever. 
but that's that's enough of that. I, I think uh, what the value today is, uh, especially with the new certification program, is is the, the global look at at what's behind it. And I, I remember in the same job where I got hired because I was accredited, um, that was an international company. They were very much focused, most of the business was manufacturing, very much focused on ISO quality, ISO 9000, 6000, whatever thousands there were, they were they all had it and all the automakers and all the major manufacturers and they would say to me, my bosses would say to me, well there's no communication piece in there. So I started combing through the thing, uh, the materials they were, they were massive and I was able to pull out a few marketing things that sort of fit what I did and I would try to rise to those standards just to show my bosses something else that was measured, that was in their vernacular. But, but that was a very global standard at the time and now for us to use look at certification in that way I think it's very very important with our organization and our profession. Well I think that is one of the distinctions in setting up this uh, global certification council that's running things. Um, you know, Before with the accreditation program you had to be an IABC member and then you could qualify to take the examination. When it's all up and running in a full-blown manner um, anyone who is interested in the profession anywhere in the world can take the exam. One would hope that they would also like to join IABC for some of the professional networking from the professional development that can help you prepare for the uh, certification process. But membership in IABC is not required to be certified, and um, there is an outside body that has put together the tests, who is validating the tests. Um, it's it's really important that we you know recognize that we're trying to get to that point that you said is a weakness shell, which is can we come up with something that's uh, a little bit more widely recognized across the industry, just the way maybe a CLU or a CPCU might be in insurance or a CPA and the accounting side of things. A long way to go, but um, you know it would be nice to know that we're taking some of those baby steps to see if we can get there. But th this is Mark. I, I think a couple of uh, uh, thoughts come to mind. First of all, this, as, as it has been since we exams many years ago, uh, this, this process, this experience is what someone makes of it. And so there is always going to be a, a very important personal dimension to this because of the accomplishment that it marks. Where I think as a profession and as an association we need to do more, and I think it's a challenge to us, is how we use any kind of standardization or certification as a way to educate the business community about what our profession is all about. Um, my, my primary job these days is to work with senior leaders of companies. They appreciate communication as an outcome. They are generally clueless about what it takes to create that outcome. And so I think that especially with the new framework, we have an opportunity to educate those who rely on us about what it actually takes to get it done. I'll, I'll, um, I'll echo what, uh, what Mark just said in terms of making it, sort of owning it, making it our own. And I think that comes down to individually as well. And I'll, and I'll jump from there to... Um, slight bit of a devil's advocate position, which is that it that as with all of these kinds of things, um, and I'm seeing it more and more, I do some work in um, alumni communication and, and um, some, some university communication, and really it comes down to the brand and the, and the brand of that community. And um, so when I see our colleagues looking at um, PhDs, other other postgraduate um, degrees, certifications, programs, etc. They're looking at those programs and those credentials for two reasons, in my observation. And like many of you, I'm sure I, you know I've been called on to write letters of attestation and report and those kinds of things. Um, I did one recently for someone who was applying for a master's program that is fully taking into account this person's IABC experience uh, as, as part of the qualification for starting down that path, but I digress. Um, what, 
what they're all looking for is the connection to a brand that is called the, the, the master's brand or the PhD brand that those terms stand for and or the brand that that particular institution of higher learning represents so and all of those have their own nuances and their own um, brand attractions I think IBC's job in the coming years with the new certification program is to establish that certification brand because it has been identified as separate from IBC. So to identify that certification brand is something that is recognized in the business world and in our circles. And I'll be honest, I think that's a that's a big, big challenge. I hope we succeed. One of the issues is Oh, no, I'm feeding back from somebody. Um, I, I can hear myself coming out over somebody else's speakers. So if uh, whoever that is makes me switch to earbuds or, or headphones. But you know, one of the issues is that it's not a requirement to have an accreditation or a, a, a certification to work in the industry. But there are a couple of places where it is. Um, I was in Puerto Rico last year for a little bit, and uh, they do require... Uh, a certification uh, for uh, people to practice public relations in in Puerto Rico in the island and uh, it's based heavily on academic background uh, and uh, I've, I've been hoping to get uh, the person who's uh, chairing that uh, certification committee that manages that process uh, as a quasi governmental agency uh, to do an interview and talk about it but um, you know there are uh, a lot of objection to the idea that this would be a requirement. Um, I think you know one of the reasons that I, I, I most often hear uh, is that unlike accounting, where there is one right way to do something, in communications there are many, many right ways to do something, uh, even something that people may not have thought of before. But I wonder what you think of the idea of requiring a certification to work in this industry. Shell, you know, the global piece, um, as you know, I teach part-time at the university level and have for a number of years. And in the, I didn't learn this on my own because I ran into these people. I just know of this from the textbooks. I wrote a couple of things down. And, and it was about licensing. And we've had this conversation over time in IBC of, of between licensing and accreditation or certification. And, you know, what's the real difference? And licensing, um, thinking along the lines of what... Jen was talking about is something that I think people understand a little more globally than getting their arms around what's this certification and um, the licensing of our already exists in Brazil, Nigeria, Panama, and Peru and you mentioned Puerto Rico and Kenya was also looking at it in the last five years in, in, in a situation where nobody would be able to practice in their country unless you had a license. So I, I think that people are trying to get around, get their arms around what is this um, communication or PR and it becomes even more difficult for IBC because I, I think research is easily understood and PR is talked about worldwide but we have so many other nuances of communication jobs in our IBC that it becomes even more difficult. But um, I, I, I'm with I'm with Gwen, uh, with Jen on this um, thought about we've really we've really got to people go to get a PhD from a good university because of their brand, and and we've got to tie our brand to something like this, even though it may be difficult. Um, so certification is it for now. So I'm, I'll be a cheerleader, but it's hard work. Uh, I, I would agree. Um, th this is Mark, and I, I, as many of you know, um, we're quite active at IBC in the Global Alliance, which is an association of associations focusing on communications and public relations around the world. And we held a summit a little over a year ago, and Russell Grossman, the then IABC chair, was an active participant. And the conclusion of this group of people from all over the world is it, it will be very difficult to come up with one global standard simply because the profession is at different levels of maturity in different parts of the world. But that there is a need for a common framework of what the profession should contribute to the people who asked us to work for them. And so it was it was somewhat shy of the licensing discussion, 
but it was certainly much stronger a, a call than the kind of laissez-faire way that we've we've existed for a long time. It it, it does seem to me that the, the real challenge we have is is not letting any effort to to create standards that would then be tested. We can't let it totally follow one point of view because we are a profession where there are many views of how it's done, what it can do, and what it requires. And I think it requires a little bit of an open mind too. I mean here in North America we've had pretty much a, a free-for-all. Anybody who wants to be a communicator doesn't have to have the training, doesn't necessarily have to. People move in and out of the field somewhat readily um, and certainly we've seen that in terms of uh, when IABC and PRSA and all the other communications organizations do recruiting. You know, we people don't necessarily stay in this field uh, for a lifetime. So um, it's it's one of those where I think we're going to have to look at some other models in other parts of the world and say, is there some value in that? I think the one thing that the GCC has been trying to lean on, and Barb hit on this earlier, is the whole set of ISO standards. You know, if we can do it in manufacturing, if we can do it here, what are some of the agreed upon? How can you get to that gap sort of stuff? stuff that are generally accepted accounting principles but applied to communications that cut across the board and that do have some universality because it's real easy to get a group together and the first thing you do is you don't understand us, we're different from you, you'll never understand us unless you live here and then what you find out is after you get that out of the way people begin to focus on what we have in common rather than what we have as differences that separate us. You know who did that really well was China during the 2008 Olympics where they brought everybody who had anything to do with PR together to, to pitch that or um, um, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank but even earlier than that a major world conference of they bring all the corporate and the government and any kind of PR people together to collaborate um, to pitch why why they're um, they're an important venue. Well, IEBC made the decision, as I mentioned earlier, to um, switch from accreditation to certification. And and Brad, since you're uh, the one among us who has been through this, maybe you could uh, start this part of the discussion by explaining the difference. Wow, um, <laughs> there, there are some things on the surface that are different. Uh, I think the, the, one, the one biggest difference is that before the accreditation was a four and a half hour process as a written and oral exam uh, for which there was a lot of study that uh, could go into it but it was also more a test of two things. One is what did you have built up in terms of your uh, body of knowledge and two can you manage time well to get through this thing. Uh, the certification process is a three hour um, exam and it's all multiple choice at this stage. Now you have to go through some stages before that to be able to prove that you're willing to and capable of sitting and have the credentials. So just like the accreditation process asks you to put together a portfolio to do things, there are some uh, hurdles that you jump through to be able to sit for this three-hour exam. But then the three-hour exam itself is um, it's a hundred multiple choice questions. They've all been tested and validated. They have different versions of this examination. Um, there were some people who said, can this be a valid test the same way doing short answers or essays that uh, accreditation has? And having been through it, I could say, yeah, there were some tough questions in there. Of the hundred, I think I, um, I, I circled back and went and really read over and over and thought about the answers on about 15 to 20 of them that I had circled on my uh, score sheet that really said, ooh, you know, what are they trying to get at? What could be the right possible answer? So um, it's, it's a little less of a time management exercise. It's a little bit, um, I'm not sure that you can study for it any more than you can really study for a, an accreditation exam. Uh, but I found the process to be a very, very valuable one. And again, you know, remembering the, oops, these are the kinds of things I know go back and uh, beef up in my portfolio. This became a good uh, reminder. And this is you know, the ultimate plan for IBC GCC is to have three levels of examination, and this is just one of the three. This is sort of the middle level that they've introduced. There'll be one below this for, in a sense, the entry level or, you know, early practitioners, and then one for the senior level. Um, I hope I can do as well when I get to it 
at the high end. The other piece that I should let you know is that the six people who took it, uh, the very, very first one, all six passed it. Now, I don't know what the pass rate is right now, but uh, uh, we all made it. So that's, that's good. And there were three people who'd been there and three who hadn't. I think, I think it's, it's quite interesting to go back, and Jennifer will remember this uh, extremely well because you lived it. Uh, the the idea or the framework or the genesis of, of what is now certification really um, really came from uh, IABC members and we did some research about six years ago about what the association could do to better serve members and out of that research came the plea for some kind of certification that would track a career so that those in the early stages of their career could demonstrate proficiency and those in later stages could demonstrate growth. And I, somehow we affectionately, informally started calling that, Jennifer, you'll remember, the merit badge concept, <laughs> which was I could earn a merit badge in this and I could earn a merit badge in that and ultimately I would get the ultimate merit badge. Fortunately, that, uh, that informal illustration has gone away. But it does serve to, I think, an important point that, 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 that this does need to be a fluid kind of process that tracks personal progression as well as changes in the profession. And that's what this new certification really enables. And certification, you need to be sort of re opt every year. There is a little requirement that you continue to take education, you continue to sort of prove that uh, it's, it's lifelong learning and it's not a one-time event that once I'm, you know, one and done kind of thing, which the accreditation was, um, this has got a little bit more of a commitment over time to it. Uh, by the way, I uh, let everyone know when promoting this that uh, you'd be able to ask questions and I tested the Q&A feature yesterday and today it's saying that it's disabled and I can't figure out how to enable it. Uh, one of the challenges with Google Plus Hangouts on Air. So I have very hastily created a hashtag and uh, we do have some people watching live and if anybody has a question just use Twitter. Uh, the hashtag that I cobbled together is IEBC shuns S-H-U-N-S not that IABC shuns anything, but uh, that's the way we've been promoting this uh, this particular discussion, uh, the shuns accreditation, certification, education. Uh, so IABC S-H-U-N-S is the hashtag. Anybody with questions can uh, fire it off with that via Twitter, and I'll let everyone on the panel know uh, what the question is. Um, yeah, I was uh, in a discussion at a world conference where they were first starting to broach the idea of certification, and the consultant that we were working with at that time explained to us that uh, accreditation is something that an organization usually gets, uh, not individuals, even though we have a lot of accreditations in the profession. PRSA offers the... Uh, uh, their accreditation. I know CPRS has one. I, be I believe there's an accreditation out of a number of national communication organizations around the world. Uh, but Brad, with, with certification, there's also this coordination with uh, the International Standards Organization, ISO. Uh, do you have any background on how that came to be, how the, the standards that are established by that group played into uh, a communication certification program? I uh, don't have any of the details. I do know that it's going to take us two or three years to be able to get to that ISO level because I think what happens is you have to put things in place and then show over a period of time that you are meeting those standards. It's not instantly uh, given, but the, the whole development of the GCC and the certification process was based on we need to do this to be able to make sure that we're following the ISO guidelines so that we can become ISO certified and that the testing of the questions, the people who put this thing together, the uh, you know the, the beauty of this thing I, the, you know the part I like best is um, having I've actually been certified by another organization in um, in management of uh, partnerships um, the strategic alliance partnerships and I was amazed at the process that they go through on the certification you actually take an online exam and it was almost, I won't say open book, but it was, it was quite. And so I was saying, you know, there's, there's something that they know about the process that IABC and GCC could probably pick up on and learn because this idea of being able to take it from any place in the globe, sort of on your own, at the uh, your own computer, 
they're doing some cool things with the technology that we need to catch up on. And so I think we're moving in that direction. And so when you get the score sheet, it's Scantron, which reminds me of things that I did back in high school and <clears throat> later. But I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. And ISO is uh, looking over our shoulder with the idea of certifying the process in about two to three years from what I understand. Shell, if I may, let me if if I could jump in with a sort of an overarching philosophical comment because we're talking about a lot of the technicalities of certification, and I'm just thinking about our audience and how some of them may be tuned in, wondering about just the why. Why should I do this? Should I do this? You know, at what point in my career is it relevant? And I guess what I'd like to do is step back and talk about just for a moment from my perspective and invite you guys to do the same. Um, that super compelling reason above all else, which is um, lifelong learning uh, reasons, lifelong learning, and finding a structure that works for you no matter who provides that, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a university, a college certification program, an association like IABC, or any other, like the, like the certification you referenced, Brad. Um, Find that. It would be my message to our to our listeners. Find the one that works for you. Start down a path. It may not be perfect. But what accreditation did for me back then and IEBC's programs, and I'll add another shun, which is celebration and recognition, which is in IEBC's awards programs. What that did for me was uh, ultimately less about the letters behind my name, although I'm so proud of those, and more about the structure it taught me and approach to work that it taught me that I bring to every single strategic conversation that I have. I wa literally walk into a first client meeting thinking through in my head, who's the audience, what are my objectives, what are my goals, what are, how am I going to move the needle in this from a business, how does this relate back to the business goals. So. Whatever your passion is, whether it's managing partnerships, managing projects, being a strategic communicator, being a tactical communicator, find a program, find a, a process that is going to take you through and validate and measure along the way so that when you come out the other end, no matter what those letters are, you've got a degree of confidence in yourself that's going to take you further than if you hadn't done that. Well, I think that raises an interesting question, Jennifer, and that's when should uh, people really start to think about getting accredited? I mean, I think there's a uh, a case to be made uh, to get rolling on this when you first, you know, start thinking about becoming a communicator, uh, starting your career, uh, so that you have that baseline that that somebody hiring you at an entry level uh, knows that while there will obviously and always be some on the job learning, you come in with a base, you know, a core set of skills and a core set of knowledge that allows you to hit the ground running. Um, where in your career should you be when you start thinking about doing this? I think early, early, early. Uh, I, 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 you know, I was 12 when I took the exam. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I certainly um, didn't expect to pass. And I think back to Barb's comment about what you learn from the process. Uh, I, I just started a new semester. I shared the framework with my students the first class because I think that our, our framework absolutely nails the progression that any person at any point in their career needs to look at. And I want people to you know look at it from the beginning. And so I think that I think starting it early with with the hope that I will learn from this. And if you know the shun of recognition comes then that's that's great. Mm -hmm. But whenever it comes it will feel good. So I have I have two thoughts on what you just asked. And one is I, I work with a group that is board certified pediatric dentists and the younger uh, dentists coming out of school earning their doctorates now actually become board certified as part of their curriculum as they're coming out. So that's a, that's a good idea you put out there that perhaps some of the younger communicators, I mean perhaps we could um, tie it into some university programs and and get some more clout for how that evolves. But my, my other thought had to do with the university setting. Half of this, I teach non-traditional students and half of my students are US military stationed around the world. And I found that some of my students should be teaching my class. But as 
proud as a military person is of what they study or what they do or the rules they follow or the direction they're going, these military guys, and they are mostly guys, serving places at, like the front lines in Iraq or something like that, and they're the public information officer, they've had this fabulous education in the military all about communications, but that's not good enough. They want this university deg degree now. They're working on it now while they're still in the military so that the, when they retire, they can hit the ground running in the civilian workplace. They, they don't value the wonderful education they've already had in the military enough or feel the, feel the world doesn't value it enough. So they've got to get this other college degree. So I think if we want to improve our reputation with certification and IABC, that we should tie more into universities. I know we've had great relationships with the universities, but we ought to work even harder at that with the students coming out out of the universities today. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Uh, a lot of people come into the profession uh, through academic channels, uh, but we all know people who got into communications through other lines of work. Uh, you know, when I do work with public relations agencies, uh, I talk to some fairly senior people uh, at these global agencies, uh, you know, the Fleischmann Hillards of the world. Uh, who came through government channels or they, they came in because they were lawyers. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, we have a lot of people in this profession who moved over from journalism as, as uh, there's a contraction in the ranks of uh, professional journalists. We've seen a lot of people move into public relations. Uh, what about them? I, mean, I, I talked to somebody who became a, a, a communicator after... Uh, uh, a, a career in, in uh, ac uh, they were uh, teaching history in, in, uh, at the university level and just made a career switch. You know what's interesting about that observation, Shell, is that um, when I come across those folks, and I'm working right now with an absolutely brilliant communicator and writer who is a former lawyer and so brings a whole wonderful filter and set of experiences to his work as a communications professional. Um, and so, <laughs> ironically, I, I immediately afford him more credit because of his previous credential or education. Um, the same with a nurse I recently worked with as a volunteer uh, who had moved into communications. Um, because they have achieved a certain level of professionalism in one in one career, I they immediately are elevated <laughs> to, in, in my mind at least, uh, in the communications profession. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I, it, it, just when you were talking, I, I, uh, I observed that. Well, it is a very interesting question. I was going to say we would probably even want to focus a little bit on the education part of things. We've talked accreditation, we've talked certification, but this whole value of other letters and you know many in the profession have come in with that liberal arts of some sort background, whether it's English or communication or journalism. Um, and I think we do have tremendous respect for people who've been able to go deep in something um, that's related to the business in which they work. In a sense, we're generalists often. Um, we come into an organization, we're not line people, we're staff people. And granted, lawyers can be um, staff as well, but you know, we appreciate somebody who's got that ability to go deep where we've been able to go wide and thin. So um, I think, you know, where does that, you know, postgraduate stuff come in? Is it that we need to have everybody become, you know, masters in communications? Do they need to pursue MBAs? Do they need to be able to go to short courses? Um, you know, I'm fortunate I work for a large corporation at Cisco Systems, and one of the things that we have is a lot of in-house training. We even have a little certification program around social media that, uh, you know, as soon as the classes started coming out, and the beauty is you can take them online and uh, pass a little exams online and you become certified within Cisco so I, I look at all of these sources and I think the real important thing that we've sort of hit upon this is how do you do that self-assessment that says what's missing in my portfolio um, what do I need to build up how do I 
make sure that I'm relevant? How do I know that I'm adding value in the right places for the people that I'm working for? And I think the other piece that I'd emphasize, and you sort of said this before, is uh, to somebody who's thinking about this, is it's almost like a chess game. You need to plan the couple steps ahead. Where's all this stuff going? What am I going to need to be able to not only do the job I'm doing now, and maybe that next one, but the one beyond that? What's going to be most valuable in the future to employers, potential clients, the places where I want to work? You know, I, uh, I, I speak at a lot of conferences where uh, before the session begins, the host of the conference says, uh, those of you who are taking this session for continuing education credits, be sure to you know do whatever the process uh, requires them to do uh, to get those credits. And I, this doesn't happen at IEBC or PRSA conferences that I'm aware of. But, you know, thinking about the fact that I got my accreditation in 1984, that was before the net, that was before the web, that was before intranets, that was before social media. And to have that ABC after my name as a presumption that I have the skills required to practice today, uh, I, I think is a heck of a presumption. Uh, how We're going to have to talk that? to you about that. You really yeah. need to bone up on yeah. all that stuff on the electronic we side. Got, we got issues with you, Shell. Uh, yeah, well, and, and, and I laugh. I think I got it before there was electricity. I, I think that um, you hit upon a really important thing, both Brad and Shell, and that is it's another shun. It's about accrediting, standardizing, certifying, communication, and that's a broader discussion than certifying the communicator. And if we're going to look at the profession as a body of active knowledge, and we need to put discipline and rigor around the accessibility of that knowledge and the application of that knowledge, that's where it becomes a bigger discussion. Because it should be as accessible to the mid-career person who used to do something very different as to the communicator who has known this is the career path for a long time. And that's where it is larger than the communicator. It really is about the discipline around documenting a profession. Anybody else have uh, thoughts on this? I mean, I, I agree, Brad. There are uh, a lot of organizations that offer internal certifications. One that I've been dealing with quite a bit is uh, certifying people to become um, ambassadors on behalf of their organizations through uh, social media channels. Uh, Dell, for example, has a, a certification program. Uh, Coca-Cola's certification program actually enables uh, employees to become official spokespeople uh, within their communities. Um, and, and it's essentially the same kind of media training that executives uh, go through and, and uh, subject matter experts who've been designated to be spokespeople on those issues. Um, but those don't translate outside the organization. Certainly you accumulate the knowledge, but uh, you know, the certification doesn't travel with you, right? No, but I think, again, if you, if a potential employer, just like they were looking at Barb's uh, accreditation as a, a thing that set her apart, if you come in with, the, and I've completed these sorts of internal training programs in addition to doing this on the outside, I went to World Conference, I attended these sessions. I mean, you don't need to pull each one of those things out and put it on your resume, but I think those are the kinds of things that at some point, one will benefit you as an individual, but will also translate into the skill set that you're going to need to be competitive. And I think that's something that we've been talking about is one is staying relevant, staying competitive in the marketplace, and third, being able to make contributions that are measurable to any sort of an organization, be it a client-based one or a corporate one or a nonprofit one. Well, whatever happened to that merit badge idea? I, I circulated an article uh, earlier this week uh, with you folks, and uh, it, it talked about employees who are taking these online courses through you know, Coursera and um, online universities and uh, getting these sort of mini degrees and uh, they, they refer to this as sort of badges uh, that maybe uh, get added to your, your employee profile and, and signify that you've had a certain kinds of learning. Um, is, is that still a viable concept within the IEBC world or, or in other communication organizations you may know about? You know, Michelle, what I always loved about the merit badge concept, as we called it uh, a few years ago, is that it, it, it provided a framework for how the opportunity to seek recognition would create the framework for education. 
and so it would it would be something that we could look at for the profession, for the association, and for the individual. So I do think that that when we recognize that there are, as you mentioned earlier, Brad, different specialties that people might pursue, as well as the general accumulation of knowledge that's necessary, there's a lot to say about the merit badge. If you know, if you go back to groups that have merit badges, you have to like learn how to tie knots, and you have to learn how to first aid and you have to learn a whole bunch of basic things well you know there's a lot to be said for the fact that anyone practicing in this profession should have some basic things that they need to be able to do and as well there may be certain specialties that people want to pursue any program needs to be flexible enough to accommodate both everyone wants badges on their poncho let's be let's be honest yeah, well, well, that's why gamification is a, a, an effective technique, right? Is is mm -hmm. there's an intrinsic reward to having that that symbol that you have achieved something that other people can see. And the real answer is we've had it all along too. You could take a class at San Jose State University and get a certificate in something, and somebody gives you this little framed thing with a couple of signatures at the bottom when you've completed the coursework. Um, be it a, a weekend executive kind of thing or one night a week for eight weeks um, is short of committing to going to you know the, that master's program or something else but it shows that you're developing a skill set in an area that uh, you wanted to do so we, we've had it all along I think some of it's just changing venues and uh, whether it's gamification or going online it's the same sort of stuff yeah one of the challenges I think that um, most communication associations organizations that have some sort of a shun uh, accreditation or certification uh, that they face is is getting people excited about it I mean uh, in, in IABC accreditation uh, accounts for what about 10 percent uh, of the membership and and most people just ignore it how do how do associations go about uh, you're really promoting the value of this and, and, and get people excited and, and, and get people on board to pursue this. Well, I, well this uh, is... Uh, go ahead, Mark. Well, this is something uh, that we talk a lot about in the New York chapter because we're in the middle of uh, a very crowded marketplace, certainly crowded with communicators, others who practice communication in a lot of associations. And one of the conclusions we have come to is that uh, the, the outcome of people seeking professional development and seeking professional recognition requires that we educate the business community about the profession and that we, the more we educate the business profession about what we do and what it creates and the value it can bring and what it takes, then professional development as a personal decision and recognition as a personal choice will, will come after that. But we have to begin by educating the world about what we do. I think it's going to vary too by by market. And Barbara, you you touched on this to do with some of the areas in the world that are that are requiring certain degrees of licensing. Um, I can speak from experience in Canada, of course, where um, where even in the at the peak of the accredit of IBC's accreditation program, IBC I, IBC members in Canada represented a larger percentage than the rest of the membership. So we have a lot of ABCs in Canada and a lot of interest in the new certification program, and a lot of people fishing around wondering what to do. Um, and and so I think it's going to I think we're at a we're at a bit of a transition point in in our profession and in the in the industry in terms of the way we. Um, label that and define that and um, in my role on the regional board as a recycled leader um, I know we're we're looking at the ways in which we can um, harness that passion in Canada for uh, for for the idea of lifelong learning and recognizing that along the way no matter what we call it uh, Barb you have okay. I'm sorry no, now who's going? <laughs> yeah, you're going. I, I said, unfortunately, I think um, that we can only solve it by having critical mass. Uh, you know, this going. This is an ongoing story. I've been a member for 40 years. How do we convince the, uh, the audiences we work 
for the people we work for, the organizations we work for, that this is truly valuable. One of my um, favorite experiences as a as a teacher, college teacher, has been um, somebody saying to me in class, well, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I thought I wanted to be in communication. And I don't. I want to do this and such. But I can see by taking these couple of courses that no matter what job I would ever have, aspire to have, that the communicator will be an important part of my team. And that was that was special to me because that, that was what I was trying to convince the students of in the class, that communication is wound around so many things that we do in life, and it doesn't have to be necessarily your career, but you'd better know about it for whatever career you have. And so that's an idealistic statement. I don't really expect anybody to answer. It wasn't a question, but I just think we need critical mass before people be convinced when when accredited IABCers push accredited IABCers, that grows. When certi I'm sure it will be the same with certification. It works that way with fellows. It works that way with senior leaders mentoring people. And it'll, it'll, I don't know that it'll ever be accomplished. Uh, as we have about 10 minutes left, and I see that we have uh, some new people having uh, joined as, as viewers, uh, the, I want to let you know that the Q&A function on the uh, Google Plus Hangout on Air uh, for some reason isn't working, and I set up a hashtag, uh, I-A-B-C-S-H-U-N-S, I-A-B-C shuns. So if you have questions, uh, just head on over to Twitter and fire them off with that hashtag, and I'm monitoring that hashtag and can pass any questions along to the panel. Uh, Barb, you have an MBA, right? No, I have a master's in corporate and political communication. Ah, okay. Inter uh, interestingly, it's from like Fairfield University. Is 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 that there's a value for communicators to go get an MBA. I know a lot of uh, communicators who have uh, because it gives you a better insight into the kinds of uh, intricacies of business that you end up uh, reporting on if you do internal communications or dealing with the press on if, if, if you're doing external communications. Uh, I, I wonder if you think there's value in getting that kind of uh, education outside of communication and then we can talk about um, what you've done Barb and, and, and certainly Barbara Gibson, former IABC chair living in the UK who's gotten a PhD uh, in all of this. Well and, and, and there are other examples as well. Shelley Bird, uh, a former chair of IABC, uh, secured her doctorate during the time she was very active with the association. I think that uh, I think you hit upon it earlier with the commitment to lifelong learning. There are many frameworks we can follow to learn throughout our careers and I, I've, I've at different times people I've worked with I've suggested they go to cooking class because I thought it might unleash their creativity. I've sent people to basic woodworking because they were having trouble holding things together. Uh, I, I think that whatever the, the source of the education is, there is room for it in a profession where the strengths we bring can come from many places. I think the value of any kind of standardization is it helps funnel all those experiences into answering the question, how does it apply to the successful application of the profession? It's interesting, Shell. At one point, I actually had taken the accreditation exam saying, well, if I do that, then maybe I don't need to do an MBA. Uh, it turns out um, very, very different processes, different goals in mind. And I found uh, I went through and did the MBA in what I called, it was while I was going to uh, a lot of IABC chapters as chair. Um, I did a class a quarter for what seemed like forever in a, in a night program at Santa Clara University. It gave me some of the theoretical background that went along with sort of that on-the-job learning. And I will also say that um, having gotten the MBA, it also allowed me to speak the language of business that that pure liberal arts undergrad didn't really have the discipline to pick up. You know, I hadn't taken enough business classes when I was an undergrad to be able to be conversant with the folks in accounting, the people across an organization. So rather than pursue an MA in something communications related, I found that the MBA for the places that I were working and hoped to work was a valuable asset in my skill set that nobody else had. And, and there are those what about, two words again, personal initiative. I guess maybe I'm a junkie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think you learned French in that program too, You're right? You're just Does smart, Brad. You're just smart. Uh. <laughs> uh, Barb, what about uh, the degree that you got, which was communications related? Yeah, and it was unique at the time. And and Fairfield doesn't have this exact program anymore. They had it for 20 years. And they very much tried to integrate us into the business world and help us. I mean, there was a foreign language requirement in that program. There were always business, high-level business speakers. And we were sitting in the middle of Fairfield County, USA, Connecticut, where there were many corporate headquarters, easy to drag some speakers in where we would get a lot different exposure than we might if we were just following communications type studies. Um, I don't, I, I often considered an MBA. Fairfield was just closer to where I was and that was a unique program so that's why I did it. I always thought it was helpful to me. I finished that in, my seven, in the 1970s and I always thought that was helpful. Where, where I teach now, I'm at the highest level I can be with a master's degree. Um, and I think it's important that people who choose to study further look at the organization, the institution they're studying with. I think we alluded to the uh, ease of getting a, a diploma online now, but who's giving that out? Is it a legitimate organization? Is it an accredited university? Who is your teacher? Does your teacher know the subject you're trying to learn? Have they ever done it before? Or are they just reading it out of a book? I have a bias about among my peers when I hear that somebody's retiring from our profession and they say okay now I'm going to go teach college and I think that's the worst teacher the worst kind of person to be in college the college students need to hear, hear professors who are active in the uh, in the profession they're teaching I believe that's my bias and then I find the PhDs who I admire are, are really delving into measurement and research at a higher level and teaching the higher level student. So uh, it's, it's, those are great aspirations and I think they're useful. But again, personal initiative, personal need, all comes to play and we can't control all that. Well, we have about three minutes left, which is enough time to go around the table one last time and, and make your best pitch to people who are uh, watching live or will be watching the recording or listening to the audio podcast uh, for pursuing uh, one of the shuns or all of the shuns. Uh, Jennifer, how about you first? Oh, sure. Put me on the spot. Um, you know, I'll just reiterate, I guess, what I said before, which was which is finding a... a uh, imprinting on yourself a structure and a process that's going to work for you in whatever stage of career you're at. Um, I, I get lots of people earlier in their career still coming to me and asking me what they should do um, and uh, you know how, what they should pursue. And uh, and while that question, while that answer used to always be IBC accreditation and and is now IBC certification, I think as IBC certification program is unfurled. And we get a sense of how that's going to mark the the whole um, arc of that is going to mark help mark our careers. That will be easier for us to um, latch onto and promote and experience. Um, for now, I would say uh, you know per pursue whichever one feels sort of connects with your 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 hunches of where you're going and where you need to be and who you need to be speaking to. Great. How about you, Mark? I think that uh, <laughs> anyway, this is this this is Mark. I think that it it goes back to something that has been at the core of what many have said today, and that is we each seek this this work for particular reasons, and we each need a, a radar that helps us know if we're on track. The value of any recognition program, education program, is it helps add depth to that radar. So I think find find your path and find your radar and use these programs to help you stay on, on track. Brad? Well, we can all sit here and learn something by just Googling things, but I think the real answer is that um, on-the-job training provides one set of uh, learnings, but there are many times in life that you need to have some structure to the learning. And I think what we're talking about in all of these is a structured approach to being able to tackle some topics that may not be 
in your comfort zone that need to be for you to be effective. And I would say to anybody who's thinking about this stuff is one is you owe it to the person who's paying for your services to be on the top of your game. And the second is you owe it to yourself to be the best you can be. And this is one way to get there and guarantee that you're there. Great. And Barbara. Well, I certainly agree with what my esteemed colleagues have all said, but I'd, I'd say one more thing. Um, besides the structure that Brad articulated so well that one size just never does fit all. And that just like IABC talks often and works hard at building a body of knowledge, we all as individuals and professionals ought to build our own personal body of knowledge and be, be comfortable that we, we're always learning something new and sharing that with others. Great. And that takes us exactly to the top of the hour. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the hour of your time today. Uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, you can send them uh, directly to uh, the podcast email address, uh, which is fircomments at gmail.com. Of course, this will be available as a audio podcast and as a YouTube video uh, within the next day or two. Um, so uh, we will be back in February uh, with another circle of fellows, another collection of fellows talking about another single topic and uh, until then I hope everybody has a great month. Thanks all. Thanks Shell. Thanks, Shell.